Hi folks, welcome back to my channel. Um, well, I've managed to acquire this, which is, I suspect, the smallest refractor telescope on the market. It's the Ascar FMA135, and today I'm going to have a little look of what you get when you buy it, and uh, have a little test on a few stars tonight. So uh, yeah, hopefully you'll join me for that. My name's John and I make videos on camping, walking and astronomy. If you like what you see in this video then please check my channel out as you may find others that interest you there. But in the meantime let's crack on with this video. So it comes in this uh, small box here as you'd expect for such a, a small size refractor. So um, yeah let's open it up and see what you get when you first get your parcel. So let's open the box up and you get a QA checklist, a basic instruction manual, but it's all fairly straightforward. And then in the box itself, you get the telescope. A mounting ring and some fixing screws. and an adapter that enables you to fit a um, eyepiece or uh, something like a guiding camera with some little fixing screws as well. And that's basically it. Okay, so this is the telescope itself. Um, in fact, this bit here is the telescope. It's a triplet APO refractor. It's got a 30 millimeter aperture and 135 millimeter focal length. I must say the first impression of this when I got it out of the box was um, how well made it is. Everything's basically metal. So this is the refractor bit up here. This is a focusing ring which you can lock off using that little screw there and there's a graduated scale on it so that that all feels nice and quality and the back part here is a field flattener it's not a reducer it's just a field flattener which enables the telescope to become a um, f 4.5 135 millimeter astrograph so i'll show you how to connect this to your um, DSLR camera basically you just need to use this connection on the end here with a, a t-ring and you get um, perfect back focus distance and this is the adapter here that enables you to fit an eyepiece or a, a guide scope again I'll show you that so this mounting ring here will fit on a finder base down there and that enables you to use the scope here as a, a high quality finder scope or else a, um, a guide camera. But there's another use for this that I'll show you a little bit later on. Okay, so let's fit the, uh, the mounting ring. So all you do is go to the back of the field flattener Undo this piece. Pop the mounting ring on and use these screws just to lock it into place. And then you screw this piece back on again. And then if you were using this as uh, for guiding duty or as a, a high quality finder scope you now screw this adapter on and into here you can put your eyepiece or guide camera which we'll do now. So if you were using this as a, as a quality finder scope you'd now drop your eyepiece in and put these 
screws in. And that's basically it. Um, if you were trying to use this as a, a visual scope rather than just a finder scope, I think you'd probably be a bit disappointed. The 30 millimeter aperture doesn't really gather that much light. So you can't see anything other than the, the, the brightest objects. And I suspect that you'd actually be better off um, if you were doing that with a pair of like 10 by 50 binoculars or something. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's worth having a little look through just to see what you can what you can see. But um, yeah, this base here uh, would fit onto a camera tripod if you really wanted it to uh, or else a, a finder scope base. And if you were using this as a guide scope, you'd simply take the eyepiece out and pop your guide camera in just like that. My intention, however, is to use this as an astrograph with a DSLR camera. So I'll show you how you connect your, your camera up now. So as I say, my intention is to use this with a DSLR camera. Um, so to make that work, you need a T-ring that's compatible with your camera, in my case, Canon. And what we do is unscrew this visual adapter we actually need this piece and that goes back on where it came from We can then screw the T adapter there onto the end of the scope and fit this to the camera. And that's it, job done. So, well, yeah, what we'll look at now is uh, mounting this, in my case, onto a Star Adventurer. So, uh, yeah, one possibility is simply to attach the camera to the end of the counterweight system like this and off you go and then it occurred to me a little bit later on in the evening that the trouble is you're a bit stuck with the orientation of the of, of the camera so you, you can't having if this is pointing at your target you can't reformat your your image to get the um, the layout that you want so the the first thing I thought as an alternative is to screw the ring itself to the star adventurer in the hope that you could rotate the camera to get the image you want. However, the camera then interferes with the, the rest of the assembly. So I think what you probably need to do is to get an actual plate to fit under here. So you can a slide the camera backwards and forwards a little bit uh, and it and maybe clear it from the the back end of the assembly here. So that's something that, that I'll have to look at. That's not actually what this was intended for. So that might be a, um, a dead end as far as I'm concerned, but it is something that I'll, I'll look at. And in fact, mulling over the idea of a bar fitted to this ring here in order to drop the camera backwards so I can rotate it pro properly is probably um, a bit of a non-starter because if I did do that, I'd have a lot of the weight of the camera sitting too far back, which would mess my balance up. So I suspect that's uh, all a dead end. I'm going to have to not use this uh, ring here with this little setup and fix the camera straight to the end of the Star Adventurer. And in fact, in any case, that was what I did when I had my first little night out with it 
just to take a couple of quick snaps to see what the whole setup could do. So the first target that I picked was the star Altair, which is a, a very, very bright star. And the idea of that, there's a kind of orangey star that's just above that. Altair's a kind of white stroke blue star. And I wanted to see how this setup would actually pick up the colors. And I'm going to put the image up now. And you can see that it did actually pick up the, the, the orange of the nearby star uh, quite well. So I was quite pleased with that as to how the little scope and, and camera performed at picking up the, the colour of the stars accurately. The second target that I picked was one that I didn't think this would be able to cope with and that's the star Albiero in Cygnus. It's basically the head of the swan and this is a double star and I know that one star is blue and one star is orange. It looks absolutely amazing through a large telescope. I was just looking to see if this could actually split the, the, the double star. And in fact, it can't, which is no real surprise. The scope is such a small scope. I would have been astonished if it had been capable of splitting the star, let alone showing the, um, the lovely colours that, that are potentially visible there. The main target of that night was the star Seda uh, in Cygnus, just a, a bit to the left of uh, Albiero. And that's got quite a lot of uh, red gases, hydrogen gases around it. And I wanted to see again how the scope would cope uh, and the camera come to that. This is an unmodified camera here how much of the red it would pick up, how much of the different star colours the um, scope would pick up. And I took, I think, it was only a short little test, something like 40, 30 second exposures to get kind of 20 minutes worth of, of exposure time just to see what would happen. And I'll put that, that image up at the end. I was a little bit miffed because I was hoping to get one minute exposures out of this setup and I was only getting 30 seconds because the um, the stars were beginning to trail after that. So I'm a little bit mystified as to why I would expect to get a minute out of this sort of setup. And whilst 30 second exposures produced a, an, an acceptable result, uh, yeah, really, I want to do a little bit of investigative work to find out why I was only getting 30 second exposures. I think my polar alignment was correct, but maybe it was off. But I'm a little bit worried because um, my actual Star Adventurer console here took a little bit of a knock uh, after the last time that I used it. And I'm rather hoping that um, it hasn't been damaged and can't track properly. Uh, because if it has, I'll have to buy a, a new head assembly there. But I'll, um, I'll have another go shortly just to see what, what whether it was a one-off episode or not. But anyway, um, that's for the future. I'll put up the image that I took of the, the Sado region. I think you can see lots of different colours in the stars, lots of whites, blues and oranges. And the uh, gases came out around the star seda including the the butterfly nebula i just about picked up the crescent nebula right in the top of the, the the image again i was hoping to actually get that much better in the image but that's a framing issue associated with the camera not actually pointing how i really wanted it to um, but nonetheless it's in there so i was pleased at that so i shall put that image up now i'm going to do as i say a uh, um repeat exercise with a few more exposures. Now I've got a little bit used to the setup and I'll do a video on the results of that when I uh, manage to, to, to do that. So in the meantime, I uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this little mini telescope here uh, interesting and I'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>